Is the housing market finally starting to crash or is this actually a golden window of opportunity to get in? Today, I'm cutting through the YouTube drama, fire-laden thumbnails, and clickbait headlines to finally give you the unbiased, data-driven insights you can see. And I'm not talking about the mainstream data everyone else has been using. Today, we're doing some math. Hi, I'm Rick Harrison with MVP Realty, your trusted expert in Southwest Florida real estate. Today, we're diving into the market ebbs and flows, specifically what a market crash or a new bull market could mean for you, whether you're buying or selling. We'll explore best and worst case scenarios so you can make an informed decision and seize opportunities that align with your goals. And by the end of this video, you'll have a crystal clear understanding of your position in this fluctuating market. So let's cut through the noise and get started. Before we dive into the current speculation anticipation surrounding the real estate market, we need to first establish the backdrop that fuels this frenzy. And that is, of course, the 2008 housing crash. This five-year period serves as our starting point because it's what everyone is hoping for. And honestly, why wouldn't you be after these skyrocketing prices and rates, right? So let's see if this crash is even worth hoping for to begin with. First, let's talk about John. He made a decision back in 2008 that would shape his financial future. Instead of diving into the turbulent housing market, he chose to rent, shelling out a hefty $72,000 over the next five years. Not ideal, right? But did it pay off? Well, fast forward to 2012 and John finally took the plunge. He bought a home and hit the jackpot, accumulating a staggering $254,000 in equity over the course of the next decade. It's a remarkable success story, no doubt about it. But here's the thing. John's story, as impressive as it is, is what we call a unicorn case. Most of us can't time the market with such precision. And let's not forget the maintenance costs that piled up over those 10 years as well. Moreover, it's crucial to recognize that the game has changed a lot since 2012. Interest rates have soared, property values have skyrocketed, and the landscape is just totally different right now. So let's talk about what's happening today because there's a lot of chatter out there about us being at the top of the market or the peak of the market right now. You've probably seen it all over YouTube with speculation about a potential crash. So let's move beyond our hindsight is 2020 best case scenario and explore the what ifs in today's market. What are the risks and rewards of trying to time the market today? So first, let's talk about scenario number one. This would be if you're able to time the market absolutely perfectly, just like a pro, like you know what's happening next. And we're going to be using Emily for our example here. So I've already laid it all out so I can kind of just walk you right through it. So Emily sits out the market in 2023 and enters back in in 2028. Meanwhile, that entire time she's been renting. OK, so from 2023 to 2028, which is about five years, which is about what the, the 2008 housing crisis uh, took for it to bottom out those five years the market crashed 33%. So home values went down 33%. And that's exactly what happened in 2008. In the interim, she also racked up $120,000 in rent. So the average rent right now in Fort Myers is about $2,000 per month. You multiply that out over 12 months, over five years, you get $120,000 in rent. Now in 2028, at the bottom of the market, she snags what would have been a $375,000 house. But of course, with a 33% drop, that's a uh, $375,000 house is now only worth $251,000 in 2028. So she gets in at $251,000. She has a 3.5% down payment and she gets lucky enough. Rates by then have finally come down a little bit and they're back at the historical average rate of 6%. So she's sitting on looking at around a $2,000 per month mortgage payment. So now fast forward to 2033. So it's been five years now. She bought at the absolute bottom. She's now right Right after five years, the market has finally recovered 35%, which doesn't actually put her back up to the $375,000. Even though 35% is more than the 33% loss, that 35% from 251 only brings it up to $340,000. Now, that $340,000 is still a gain from the 251, right? And that's an $88,000 gain in equity, free money that just came from sitting and waiting, appreciating the market appreciating. Now, on top of that, she's also been paying into her mortgage. So she's accumulated another $50,000 in equity from just making her regular payments every month for the last five years. That comes out to $138,000 gain, right? Well, let's take a look at it a little bit closer. 2033, she sells. And after selling, selling costs, commissions, closing costs, whatever, she walks away with $120,000 net. So that's equity that she walked away with. But don't forget, 
From 2023 to 2028, she also was paying rent at $2,000 a month for five years. So that rent came out to $120,000. So even though she netted $120,000 from her actual sale, she only broke even because she spent $120,000 in rent waiting for that to happen. So that's the best case scenario if you time the market perfectly. Now, of course, these numbers don't factor in a lot of different variables, whether interest rates went up or down, whether rent went up or down during that time. It also doesn't factor into cost opportunity, but this is just to give you an illustration, approximation of what really is going on in perfect timing. And what all these people on YouTube are telling you to do, or not even just YouTube, but the media telling you to wait and just stick it out and wait to buy when it's absolute bottom. Well, this is how the math actually works. So in essence, timing the market doesn't come without its trade-offs. Emily sacrifices immediate equity growth and incurs rental exp expenses, diminishing her ultimate financial gains. Now we're going to move on to scenario number two, which is if you have, for some reason, the absolute worst timing in the world and you decided to buy at the absolute peak and would it be as bad as everyone makes it seem on these videos and all these media channels so let's just break it down in this scenario emily decides to enter the housing market in 2023 obviously little does she know she's about to buy at the exact peak of the market she ends up buying a home three hundred seventy-five thousand dollars with a 3.5 percent down payment an fha loan and she gets an eight percent rate because that's where we are right now so let's talk about where we are are at right now. The downturn happens from 2023 to 2028. Over those five years, even though her home has been losing quite a bit of value, it drops 33% and it now is worth only $251,000. So right now she's at a loss of $124,000. She's underwater, right? That's not good. Well, it depends. Are you holding on to it for the long term or do you have to sell right now? If you bought it expecting to sell within the first three to five years, you're going to be underwater. But if you're a home buyer who is actually buying a home that they actually want, can live in for quite a while if they needed to, you can still hold on to your investment and you don't have to walk away or turn in your keys. Now, back to the example 2033, she holds on to it. So she loses all that value, but she decides, you know what, I can't sell right now because you really can't without paying more money than she already has. So she's going to hold on to it for at least another five years. So she waits it out to 2033. The market again recovers 35% and now her home is again worth $340,000. So what happened here is she gained $155,000 in equity because don't forget over here, this person only gained $50,000 in equity because they waited five years to buy. This person, Emily, now has 10 years of payments into her home. So she's now accumulated $150,000 in equity. So even after you factor in the fact that it's only worth $340,000 and it's still down 35% from the original $375,000 price that she paid. She's still up $120,000 in equity. Now, if she sold after 10 years, she'll still net $100,000 at the end of that. And that's after paying closing costs and your commissions for you know real estate agents. So she held her ground and she actually comes out ahead if she just waits another five years. So what's the downside to this example? Well, Emily's obviously, she's essentially locked into her home for at least seven to eight years. Now, of course, this would change if she also decided to wait 10 years and hold on to that asset. And actually, if she did buy at the bottom and waited 10 years, she would have had a 95% equity gain. So she would have doubled her money. That would be an awesome case scenario. But most people don't live in their homes 10 years anymore. It's usually around five years or so. All right, now let's move on to scenario number three. So this would be if you're... Basically, it would be considered a safety net. So it's just like the worst timing in the world. But in this case, the Emily has actually a sizable down payment. So let's pivot to that angle. This time in 2023, when the crash begins, she does still decide to buy. She buys at $375,000. But the difference here is she puts 20% down and she still has an 8% interest rate. So now fast forward five years. The market loses 33% of the value. The home is again worth $251,000, which is comes out to again, a loss of $124,000. Now we fast forward another five years. She's held on to it. 2033 comes around. The market has recovered 35% equity. And now her home is again worth $340,000. She's still down from the 375,000. She's still down $35,000. But over those 10 years, She's gained $100,000 in equity. 
She's also got the $75,000 down payment that she put up originally for that $375,000 house. When we add those two things together, she's now got $175,000 total equity. Not all of it was earned or profitable, but $175,000 nonetheless. We take away that $35,000 difference because she's still down $35,000, right? And she comes out with $140,000 net. Now, in this scenario, she's actually made a profit of $65,000. Well, you know, over 10 years, that's not an incredible amount of value, but it's still a lot better than any of the other scenarios that we've had so far. So in this particular scenario, her proactive investment of 20% actually places her ahead. These examples are simple and really don't take into account a lot of other variables, like I've already mentioned, increasing rents or rents decreasing during that same decade. Doesn't also take into account Emily losing her job or interest rates going lower or higher. So there's definitely a lot of other factors that would need to be considered. But the point of these scenarios is, is really to show you that a lot of this noise online and in the media is just that. It's just noise. Um, it's people trying to make news or headlines and get your attention because honestly, that's how most of them get paid. Trust me, I understand how difficult and time consuming it is to make one video. So I'd be willing to bet basically that not all, but I'd say most of those influencers who are online or in the media who are putting out a video a day are not making much money, if any, from directly working with people like you who are buying and selling real estate. They make most of their money from video views, affiliate links, ad revenue, and promoting their courses. But they also do bring up valid concerns that should be addressed. So that's what we're going to dive into right now. So the first thing up is the inflation dilemma, and it's really a double-edged sword. Thinking about a home purchase amid this soaring inflation and interest rates is like trying to hit a moving target. So let's break down the pros and cons of entering the market in this current economic landscape. First, the upside of high inflation and rates, and there is an upside. The first thing is debt devaluation, and it's a huge bonus, and probably one of the reasons the government is printing so much money into existence in the first place. The high inflation can actually serve homeowners who've locked in fixed mortgage rates. You have a fixed mortgage rate and inflation goes up, that means the value of the dollar is going down, but your debt is staying the same. So in this environment, the real value of your debt actually diminishes as you repay your mortgage with cheaper dollars. On top of that, you get asset appreciation. So real estate usually holds or even increases in value during high inflation periods. And that makes it a somewhat recession resistant investment. So what's the downside of high inflation and rates then? What are you risking is another way to put it. The biggest risk is in equity gains. So while you are waiting, like we just saw in these examples, renting, uh, while you're awaiting the market st stability, you're actually letting go of all that equity you could be building over those years. And as you can see, the math comes out. It does take some time, but it does come out in your favor if you're willing to be patient and, and wait. While you're foregoing building that equity, you're also paying for someone else's mortgage who is getting that appreciation of the, the uh, asset. Um, they're also getting that equity built into there and you're paying off their investments. One of the other risks is the barrier to entry. You wanna be cautious when you're aiming for historic low rates. So if you look at the average rates over history, you would see that the average interest rate was about 6%, and that's a sustainable interest rate. Since the 2008 housing crash, when the market crashed and the economy really just came to a, a standstill, we art the Fed artificially lowered rates down to 3%. And that was artificial stimulation. So that's not something that's sustainable. And that's not something we really should go back to. Will we go back to it? That's up for debate, but it's not something that's sustainable. So I wouldn't count on it. Uh, what, what is the phrase? Marry the house, date the rate. I wouldn't count on that either. I don't count on rates ever going down. You need to do what's financially savvy for you right now. If rates make sense and you can afford it comfortably, then now's the time to buy. But if you know, you're know you expecting to be able to refinance in a couple of years at a lower rate, I really would not count on something like that. As you wait though, rising property prices will probably offset any advantages of lower rates later on. So again, it's gonna be one of those scenarios where you're really at a break even. You're not gonna be making any money and it's not a financially savvy decision. And as we just discussed, inflation isn't actually making things more expensive it's actually depreciating the value of the dollar. So that is the real reason assets and home prices go up, the value of the dollar, not the value of the home. And then there's always uncertainty. Should this inflationary period evolve to resemble the 70s and 80s, you may find yourself caught in the rent cycle for an extended period of time. 
possibly missing out on home ownership altogether. Now, I don't say that for FOMO, you need to buy now, but it is a possibility that it might get more and more difficult for you to get into the housing market if things do play out the way the 70s and 80s did. It took almost a decade and a half, almost two decades to actually get rates back down to where they were. So that could be a decade and a half to two decades where you can't get in because interest rates keep going up and prices keep going up at the same time. And for those of you that don't think home prices can keep going up with high inflation and high rates, take a look at the home prices during the 70s and 80s. That's about all they did. Now, another mysterious factor is the phenomenon being called the Great Reset right now. It's ushering in heightened institutional investments in residential real estate and driven partially by our collective financial activities. Like we all invest in REITs and index funds. This landscape is making it increasingly challenging for average buyers to enter the market. As far as I understand, this group is made up of some of the wealthiest and most influential people alive currently and has a very real agenda with a slogan that says you will own nothing and be happy. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not taking any chances missing my own opportunity to own. And that was one of the factors, a very small one, but one of the factors that did play into uh, the reason why we did buy our home at 6% uh, because we have a growing family, we needed a bigger place, and we didn't want to miss our opportunity at having to pay 8% rates later on or having to live in a very tight, cramped um, home with a, a baby and a growing, a growing child. And then of course, there's the decision to time the market perfectly, which you see how that can play out. And that's if you're perfect one way or the other. So no one can perfectly time the market. It's inherently a gamble. And anyone who tells you that they can is selling something. The goal is to evaluate your financial situation and future plans, five, 10, 20 years down the line to make as informed a decision as possible. And if you're uncertain, talk with an expert. They won't know everything or be able to predict the future, but they can give you their honest opinions historical data-driven reasoning, hopefully, and offer some invaluable guidance. Now, throughout economic downturns, inflation spikes, and interest rate hikes, real estate has remained a pretty stable investment avenue. And whether high or low, every market has its benefits. When you sell high, you buy high, and you buy low. So it's usually a pretty even trade-off. The problem for most first-time buyers or renters right now is that you don't have anything to sell yet. The trade-offs don't exist until you get some skin in the game. On the other hand, for you sellers, the obstacle is leaving your lower interest rates for a higher one. And unfortunately, that's something that may hang around for a while. Navigating the real estate market amid current economic fluctuations is complex, but it's far from impossible. So whether you're buying or selling, the key is to make informed decisions based on your unique circumstances and long-term goals. And remember, I'm here to help you make the right decision and the right move. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. So that's a wrap for today's deep dive. I hope this brings some clarity to your decision-making process. And if you have any lingering questions or concerns, my team and I are just a phone call or email away. And all my contact information, of course, is in the description. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and hit that notification bell for more tailored real estate insights. Thanks for joining me today. And until next time, stay safe, stay positive, and more importantly, stay brave.